Thank you, Jeremy. You can op open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. You know, I used to think that trembling was something of the Old Testament. That was something they did back then. Fearing God was something of the Old Covenant and not of something for us now in the New Covenant. I mean, what do we have to fear? Jesus has come, after all. And why should we tremble? There's nothing to be afraid of. Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good purpose. I guess there's still a place for such a sober heart, such a fear of God, and such a radical seriousness of what the Word of God says that would actually cause you to tremble. Have you ever trembled at God's Word? Have you ever taken it that seriously? Have you ever asked yourself, who is speaking when you're reading the red letters? Have you ever thought about it, like really considered that this isn't just a story and this, this isn't just another guy? It's not even another Bible guy. This is Jesus. This is the Son of the living God, the pre-existent one, the Messiah. The one who said of his own message, Every word I speak to you is not my own words, but these are the words of my Father who sent me. I do not speak on my own authority. I just say what he tells me to say. What a claim, what a reality that every word that Jesus said came straight from heaven. And we ought to take it that seriously. So maybe there is a place for trembling. Maybe there's a place for such a respect that comes over our hearts that it actually makes our hearts quake. And we say, Lord, whatever happens in this life, I want my life to align with your words and with your truth. I want your words to come into my life and change me. And I want to resist the urge of my flesh to change you or to join a group that changes you and twists you and makes you into somebody you are not and doesn't take you for what you really have to say. The subject that I want to speak about today is one of the most serious and tragic realities that we're facing today as a nation and as a church. This issue that Jesus spoke about is often accompanied by the most intense emotions that the human heart can feel. Tempers often flare. Deep offense is taken. Battle lines are drawn over this subject between those who call themselves Christians. Maybe you've seen it already. I have. I've seen entire families move. I've seen churches crumble. I've seen people divide. I've seen people that are calm in nature shouting and yelling. I've seen people get offended very quickly when you just quote Jesus on this matter. Many have gone to great lengths to explain it away. Few will be brave enough to face it head on, and most would just assume to ignore it altogether and act like it's not there. But the issue of divorce and remarriage must be brought up and dealt with by those who would call themselves genuine disciples of Jesus Christ. This isn't an isolated matter that Jesus spoke about once. Even if it was, it would be worthy of all of our attention. But this is something that Jesus spoke about over and over and over again. What Jesus taught about marriage and what he taught about divorce and what he taught about remarriage is a distinctive of his kingdom. 
that can't be altered. And he made sure to be clear with how he spoke about it. I don't even need to mention the mind-blowing statistics of how many people are divorced and remarried. I only need to ask this question. How many people in here do not know somebody within your close relatives or friendships who is divorced and remarried? Does anybody in here not know somebody within your immediate family or your close friends who's not divorced and remarried? And not one hand. It's all over. Faces come into your mind right now, in mine as well. People that I love dearly. Family members. People in this room. That divorce has affected, that remarriage has, has affected, that, that this whole issue is it's upon us, it's at our doorstep, it has infiltrated this nation. And the statistics of the professing church match that of the world in this nation. It's a sad state, but it's a reality. What has happened? How did Satan get in there and, and destroy? How did he twist people's understanding about this? When we look at Scripture, why does it seem so clear, but yet so few teach a serious stance on this issue? I remember being totally and utterly shocked when I, my eyes were open and I woke up to the reality of what Jesus had to say about this. I'd been teaching the Bible for five years. I was raised in... Christian America, if you want to call it that, I was raised within the church, the evangelical church, my whole life. And not one time ever was I ever taught or told that divorce and remarriage is adultery. Not one time. No pastor ever said it that I can remember. Maybe when I was really little, they did, and I, I don't remember, but I never remember hearing it once. My parents never talked to me about it. When I picked up the Bible and started reading it for myself, it's almost like I, I just glazed over it. And I remember I was teaching through the Sermon on the Mount about three, three and a half years ago to a congregation of people. And I came to some of the things that Jesus had to say about this, and I was stunned. And I was shocked. And I asked myself, who's teaching this besides Jesus? Can I even say this? Can I even read this and not be considered a heretic for just telling people that means what it says? I was shocked. I remember the day my eyes were open and my life has never been the same. This subject has brought probably more than any other subject thus far in my life the most grief and pain into my life and division within people that I love more than any other subject. And I've wept tears over it. I've lost sleep over it. I've skipped meals over it. My friends and I have prayed through the night over it. This is a serious issue. And we do well to look at it. And we do well at the outset to remember that this is not bad news. The gospel of Christ is good news. The message of the kingdom and exactly how Jesus presented it is good news. We shouldn't be ashamed of it. And as Jesus was not, we should not apologize for it. But declare the kingdom as Jesus did. When we look at statistics, we must remember that these aren't just numbers. They're people. And to every situation, there's attached deep pain, serious hurt, destroyed lives sometimes, bitter children, ruined relationships and ultimately a grieved and a reproached God especially when it happens within those who profess to follow him we must honestly and soberly look at what God's heart is on this issue and help to stem the overwhelming flood of adultery that is infiltrating the church for the sake of Christ and his kingdom it's time for the church to take a stand 
and to, to preach what Jesus preached on this, to stand by it, no matter what the cost. The words that Jesus Christ spoke about marriage have totally interrupted my comfortable Christianity. And if they haven't yet for you, as you take Jesus at face value and take him seriously, they will. Luke chapter 16, verse 14. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things that, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Let's just stop right there. What a statement. I almost did a whole teaching on just that statement alone. What is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the eyes of God. That's a paradigm shift that we need to take. That's a perspective of this God that we serve that we need to get down. Things are different with Him. His ways are past finding out. Who has ever become His counselor? Who can understand His ways? We must realize right off the bat that if we can't figure out something about God, if we can't answer the question why to everything that God has to say, it doesn't mean that it's false or that we've come to a wrong conclusion. But sometimes we just have to say that's because that's the way God is and I don't understand. God wants us to have understanding. He stores it up, he says, for the humble and, and those that are meek. He, he wants to give us understanding. But here's one aspect of God that I don't understand is that which I highly esteem or that which I naturally want to lift up or that men naturally lift up. God says it's an abomination to him. Everything that the world is applauding is an abomination to God. What men praise and the people he want, that they want autographs from and that they want posters on their wall of and that they want to look like is an abomination to God. The TV programs and the, the entertainment, the motion pictures that are on the top of the list that everybody wants to see and they can't imagine not seeing when it comes out are an abomination to God. Those things that, that everybody wants. A woman wants to look beautiful. She wants to be attractive. She wants to paint her face and and dress her body up in a way that brings attraction to her. It's abomination to God. But a meek and a quiet spirit is of great value in the eyes of God. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God stares straight at your heart. And we could go down the list of multiple things that are highly esteemed among men, but they're an abomination in the eyes of God. They're detestable to Him. He's different than we are. And Jesus declared that plainly. He said, watch out. You're trying to justify yourselves by comparing yourselves to others. You're trying to justify yourselves before people. But what's highly esteemed among men, what's recognized, what's seen as valuable, is an abomination before God. And I would say, watch out. Don't measure your success or your righteousness or whether or not you're right or wrong by what this world is doing. We've got to get that down right away. There's something that this culture says about marriage and some standard that this culture has set about divorce and laws and regulations that it has given us about remarriage. And God says, I don't go by that book. That's not what he's checking. He did not create this culture. He came to set up a kingdom that's different than this culture. So right away, we can't take our cues from this culture. We've got to realize what's esteemed in this culture, what's honorable to this culture, what's recognized as valid to this culture, often is not to our God. And that will, be, that will be not an excuse that we can have before Him when we stand there one day and say, but the Chief Justice said it was okay. Or, but my dad's example was this. Or, but I went through the right hoops. Or, it was legal. But we're dealing with God here. We're dealing with Christ. We're dealing with His words. 
He goes on to say, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. The kingdom of God is preached and everyone is pressing into it. Since the time of John, this is happening. Something dynamic and powerful and new and real and totally revolutionary happened when John the Baptist came preaching. Jesus said, the law and the prophets were until John. And since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. What was John's message? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Believe the gospel. He was baptizing people. They were confessing their sins. He was giving them a radical message of, of bringing forth fruits worthy of repentance. Repent. Turn from your old lifestyle. Get ready. The Messiah is coming. Jesus came and he picked up the same message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. And he started declaring this kingdom. He started promoting this whole idea of a whole new society and a new culture and a new way of living that he was immediately bringing into action and bringing into reality. And he was calling people into it. And Jesus is telling the Pharisees, everybody's pressing into it. People were ripping roofs off to get to Jesus. Blind men were stumbling and screaming down the road, following after Jesus to be part of his kingdom. People were following after him for three days at a time, not eating, fainting on the way, thousands of them, because they wanted to be near to him. People were abandoning their jobs, walking away from their tax booths, walking right out of their fishing boats, abandoning wealth and prestige and following after Jesus. Prostitutes were following after Jesus. People were pressing into it. People were just abandoning things and going after God. Something was happening and Jesus is saying, people are pressing into this kingdom. You're not, he could say to the Pharisees. In fact, in another place he would say, you're preventing them from entering in. The Pharisees weren't pressing in, they were standing at a distance and they were questioning everything that Jesus was doing and saying. But Jesus was bringing about a kingdom. And then as if it's just kind of a shotgun blast in the middle of nowhere, right after he says that in verse 18, he says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. It seems out of place when you read this. Almost like Luke forgot, oh yeah, Jesus said that, and he kind of just put it in there. What does that have to do with the kingdom of God? What does that have to do with people pressing in? Because right after that, he goes into a parable about a rich man and Lazarus. What is he doing here? It's as if, to, in, in my opinion, as I'm looking at this, at least one thing I'm seeing in this is that Jesus is saying, this kingdom that I'm preaching, people are pressing into it. You're missing it. It's, it's, it's a reality. Let me just give you a little example of how different it is than anything you've ever understood. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. They would have been shocked at that. Jesus' own disciples were shocked when he said things like this. Unquestionably, up to this point, they were permitted to divorce their wives, give them a certificate of divorce, and send them away. Jesus said, no more. That's not how it is in my kingdom. That's not how it is around here anymore. I'm here, I'm the king, and this is how it is. What do you do about that? Those are some big words. Jesus used the word adultery. We're not talking about theoretical adultery. Jesus is talking about real adultery. Like sneaking out of your house behind your wife's back and sleeping with another woman like breaching a marriage covenant between a man and a woman and lure, alluring a woman's husband into an adulterous affair with you. 
adultery. We've got to get that right off the bat, that Jesus is using serious words. This is something we can't just lightly look over. This isn't something we can say, well, that's interesting. He's kind of intense about marriage, and we better be careful. We've got to take it to the level of what Jesus did. He used those words. He knew the imagery that would be in their mind. Thou shalt not commit adultery. One of the Ten Commandments. A big deal. A big deal today. Jesus said in verse 17, it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Jesus came to bring a fulfillment of the shadows that the Old Testament speak of. Everything in the Old Testament is but elementary school compared to what Jesus came to bring. In fact, Paul called it the elements, the elementary and base things. Don't get back under the bondage of that. We are in the reality of the New Testament now. The schoolmaster has taught. And if the schoolmaster, the law, has fulfilled its purpose, it's brought us to Christ, the true teacher, the true rabbi. A similar scripture is in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus speaks about what he came to do concerning the law. If you turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or tittle will by no means pass from the law, till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom is here. It's time to enter in. But Jesus is saying it's, it's not a standard of righteousness like the old way, like the law and the prophets, like the Pharisees. I'm fulfilling this law. I'm bringing in something revolutionary and new. Something that is of substance compared to shadows. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount goes through point after point after point. And he says, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. And we, we heard that actually last week. Brother Jeremy shared, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is defining in his kingdom what adultery really is. He's saying it's not just actually going out and having an affair with somebody else's wife. It's not only that. It's actually having an affair with someone else's wife in your mind. Or it's, it's having an affair with any woman or any man in your mind. That's adultery. Moreover, he says in verse 31, he's continuing this whole thought of adultery. Furthermore, it's been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Jesus says it again. Jesus is very clear in what he's saying here. It used to be okay for you to put away your wife. And we'll look at that in just a minute. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 24. The Old Covenant permitted that. But I say to you, but I say to you, only Jesus has the authority to say that. We do well to recognize that authority. I want to read from Galatians chapter 5. You can keep your finger here really quickly. because we'll go right back, but I want to read a scripture that just brings some sobriety of what we're talking about here, because you might have a tendency right off the bat with this teaching, is to cast these things aside. Not because they're too hard to understand, but because the sacrifice is going to become too great. 
Because the calling to actually believe that Jesus meant these things is going to be too taxing. And the ramifications of what must be done are going to be too severe. But Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5 the seriousness of adultery and how it affects our entry into the kingdom of God. Galatians 5.19 The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is a heaven and hell issue. This is serious. Adultery is no trivial matter to our God. It's of utmost importance that we realize it's the first on that list. And God says, don't be deceived. And he uses Paul, the one that so many use to talk away Jesus and so many use to, to paint this picture that God is just mercifully overlooking all sin. He uses Paul to say, I told you this before and I'm going to tell you again. If you practice these things, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, we can see where Jesus would be quoting from and where the Pharisees would be living from, where they would take their doctrine concerning divorce and remarriage. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he's found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled. That's an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Now, a couple things about this is you can see that God is not commanding divorce and remarriage. If you read this, what he's doing is he's saying, when this happens, when a man takes a wife, and when he marries her, and he finds no favor in her, and when he does this, when he gives her a certificate of divorce and sends her away, and when she goes and becomes another man's wife, and if he detests her and sends her out, the command comes in the Old Covenant, don't go back to the original spouse, is what he's saying. He says, after she's been defiled, there's been a defilement that's happened. Even in the Old Covenant, it's viewed as a defilement when a woman becomes another man's husband. She, in the Old Testament, was not allowed to go back to the original husband. There was a certificate of divorce that could be put in a woman's hand underneath the Old Covenant. Moses permitted this to happen. We'll, we'll find out why later. We'll read another passage. But you could prevent your wife from committing adultery against you by making the divorce official. You could put a certificate in her hand. And if she went out and she had that certificate, when she got married again, she would not be committing adultery underneath the Old Covenant. You would not be causing her to commit adultery. Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 5, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. Jesus said now the man is causing her to commit adultery. If he divorces her for any reason except for sexual immorality, he causes her to commit adultery. And it says here, whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. 
This but I say to you is quite different. He's not just giving them the, the true interpretation of what Deuteronomy always meant. He's changing things here. He's making something different. He's saying the certificate is, is not allowed anymore. You can't make it official. You can't prevent your wife from committing adultery if she marries again. You can be free from causing it if you put her away for sexual immorality. But regardless of why she's put away, she will commit adultery if she marries again. And whoever marries her who's been divorced commits adultery as well. That's pretty strict. That's pretty intense. Why is Jesus doing this? Why is he paradigm shifting their view on marriage? What is Christ doing? Jesus spoke about this often. To the point where people understood within Christ's kingdom, divorce and remarriage isn't allowed. You see, the Pharisees even knew that this was a distinctive of his kingdom. They challenged him on it on different occasions. They came to him and publicly asked him questions about divorce and remarriage. If you turn to Mark chapter 10. This is one of those instances where Jesus was challenged publicly concerning this issue. Mark 10, verse 1. Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan, and multitudes gathered to him again. And as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. Testing Jesus. And he answered and he said to them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, of, or beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together... Let not man separate. In simplicity, the Pharisees are saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus is saying, not anymore. Not anymore. There was a reason that that was allowed, and it was because the hardness, the wickedness, the obstinance of your heart. But things are different now. In the new covenant, Christ comes and gives a new heart. Christ comes and takes that heart of stone out and replaces it with a heart of flesh. Christ comes and in the New Testament it says He writes His law upon our hearts and causes us to walk in His ways. The reality is greater. The glory surpasses that of the law. So much so, the Bible says that the Old Testament has no glory in comparison. And where there's greater glory and where there's, greater, there's a greater covenant and a better relationship that we can enter into, there are greater responsibilities. Too much has been given, much will be required. And now hard-heartedness is not an excuse that we can give God. Jesus takes us back to the beginning. And he says, God made them male and female. God joined them together. They are no longer two, but they're one flesh. And what God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus left it at that. His disciples wanted to go a little bit further, and I, I'm thankful that they did, because I want to know, what does he mean by that? And this is a beautiful insight that we have. Picture it, Jesus now going out of the public eye, and he, and he goes into a house, and his disciples are there with him, and, and they work up the courage to be able to ask him. And they come to him and they say, Lord, what you said out there about divorce and remarriage, what you've been preaching, can you just tell us plainly, what, what do you mean? We can't 
divorce our wives? Or what is this one flesh thing? And you're obviously contradicting Moses. I don't know what they were saying, but they ask, they're asking Jesus about this matter. And Jesus says this. It's in verse 10. It says, In the house his disciples also asked him again of the same matter. So he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So simple. So clear. And that's it. They, okay. A man divorces his wife and marries another. He commits adultery against her. He must be still married to her in God's eyes. He must be still united. He's committing adultery against her. That second wife is not really his wife. He seems to marry a woman when in reality it's an adulterous affair. The society puts the stamp of approval there. God doesn't. The society esteems it and recognizes it. It's an abomination to God. The society say it's okay for a woman to divorce her husband and to marry another. Jesus says it's not. It's adultery against that original spouse, that first spouse, that first love, that original covenant. You're committing adultery against that person. The conclusion of these things is, is pretty simple, but hard to believe at the same time. Very shocking. Divorce and remarriage is adultery in Christ's kingdom. Divorce and remarriage is adultery in Christ's kingdom. I want to keep bringing us back to the reality of this word adultery. Let's look at another one in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 10, again Paul here says, or verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Oh, when the word of God says do not be deceived, perk your ears up. Let your heart pay close attention because there's a tendency to be deceived in these areas. Don't be deceived. Don't believe a doctrine today that teaches you that fornicators, idolaters, and adulterers, and homosexuals, and sodomites will inherit the kingdom of God. Don't believe a gospel that says that you can live in sin and still go to heaven. Don't be deceived. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He who practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, 1 John tells us. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus came to give us so much more than just this idea of grace where, hey, it's, it's all okay now. I'll just cover all your sin and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this blanket of pre-forgiveness over your life. And, and it doesn't really matter how you live anymore because I paid it all. And, and I bled and I died for your sins. And so how you live has nothing to do with your eternal state. You can live just like the heathen. And you can inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible, page after page, Jesus' message through his apostles say that's not the case. And this should strike fear into our heart because as we begin to put these things together as it pertains to divorce and remarriage, if divorce and remarriage is adultery and adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God, <coughs> the only way to be set free and the only way to be at peace and forgiven by God is to repent. To repent. I know that's not a popular message and I could go on and on about how repentance has been lost today and how so many people preach a gospel without the message of repentance and it's, it's produced such a lukewarm, false church. It's so sad. I would encourage you to listen to the message that I gave on the statement of Jesus, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, people today, they love the, the thing that, that God proclaimed to Moses in Exodus. 
When he, when he said, the Lord, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness and truth. They love that part, but he went on to say this, who will by no means clear the guilty, but visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their sons to the third, fourth, fifth, I forget how many he says, but generations. But showing mercy to thousands of those who fear me. But God says, I, I, I'm merciful and I'm kind and I'm, I'm full of goodness and I'm full of grace and I, I love you so much that I gave my only son, but I'm not going to clear the guilty. I'm not going to act like it's not there. No, I'm going to empower you to walk in repentance and righteousness. Repentance is very important in the equation of salvation. The process of forgiveness and peace with God needs to be understood. First, there's sin in someone's life. In all, we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us could say that we haven't sinned. Even in this area of adultery, I don't think there's one of us in here who could say that we are innocent of adultery before God because he says friendship with this world is enmity with God. And right before that, he says, adulterers and adulteresses. Don't you know that friendship with this world is enmity with God? I know I can't say that I have never lusted after a woman. Jesus said it's adultery. And so I know I cannot say that I'm, I'm free from having committed this sin. But by the grace of God, I can say I'm free from committing this sin. Now that I've repented of this sin. Because the process of being at peace with God from your sins is that you're convicted of your sin. And then you, in humility, repent of your sin. That is, you turn from your sin. I know it's not popular today, and it might take a little paradigm shift for you to maybe get a hold of this if you've been exposed to evangelicalism for too long. But repentance means actually turning from sin. And you can do it. You can do it. It's not impossible. Before Jesus came, before the Holy Spirit was poured out, people were repenting. They were repenting at the baptism of John. They were turning from sin. And you need to turn from sin and turn to Christ. And so that process, it involves sin and then conviction and then humility, repenting and faith. Not just turning from sin, but putting your faith in Christ. In, in His ability to keep you from sin. In His ability to cleanse you from sin. Because... Just turning away from sin in and of itself doesn't bring forgiveness. I mean, how do you wash away your sin? Yeah, you can cease from sinning, you can turn from sin, but man, how do you deal with your past sin? Well, that's where the blood of Christ comes in. That's where that victory that He won on Calvary, that's, that's where we're cleansed by the precious blood of Christ. God has mercy and He forgives us as we repent. And then we gain peace with God and forgiveness. And that's abiding in Him. We walk in that peace. We walk in that forgiveness. And so we see the way that this works with all sin. All those ones there in 1 Corinthians that were listed, whether it's, let's just take one, drunkards, won't inherit the kingdom of God. So a drunkard needs to repent from drunkenness. How do they do it? They quit drinking. They put their faith in Christ. He gives them power to walk. And they walk in victory. Someone who's in fornication. We don't just say they're on their way to heaven as they're living in fornication. No, they repent of fornication. They turn from that lifestyle. They seek God. They put their faith in Christ. They're forgiven. They gain peace with God. A sodomite, a homosexual. We can't say they continue in homosexuality and they're forgiven somehow and go to heaven. No, they repent of homosexuality. They're forgiven. They're, they receive mercy. It's the same with adultery. If I was living in an affair against my wife right now with some woman secretly, we all would counsel me, or you would all counsel me to say, Scott, cease that relationship immediately. Repent. There's mercy. There's forgiveness for you. God is merciful. His hand is extended to you right now. You can be made clean. Repent. Turn from that relationship. And if I repented and turned from that relationship and laid hold of God's mercy, I would be forgiven. But to say that I could continue in that relationship, 
and be forgiven of God would be absurdity. And the reason I bring this up is because so many people, they're willing to say, I do believe what Jesus said about this. I believe that divorce and remarriage is adultery. I can't get around it. I mean, the Bible says it. I have to rip pages out of the Bible. But you can't expect me to think that God would want me to separate from my spouse. This is where the rubber meets the road. Because repentance from adultery can be very painful. And if indeed that is true, let's just say that God does not require you, if you're in an adulterous marriage, to separate from that. If that's true, if somehow you can still be a Christian, if you can be a disciple, <coughs> if you can be abiding in Jesus Christ and on your way to glory, if you could inherit the kingdom of God, and still be in an adulterous marriage, if that be true, it is the only sin. I would have to say the only sin then wherein you could remain in it and still be forgiven. There's no other sin like that. I do not believe that, that, that adultery within marriage is any different than adultery outside of marriage. Or adultery in a pornography habit. Jesus used the same word and it's just as serious and it needs to be repented of. It needs to be turned from. We cannot play games with the Son of God. I fear far too many people will stand before God one day with their fingers crossed that He really didn't mean that their relationship was adultery that they were living in. And they'll find out it was. Because He said it was. There's no way around it. What must we do? Church, what must we do as his disciples? What must you do if you're in a relationship like that? Well, I would encourage you, first of all, don't let your emotions dictate truth. It's such a snare. It's such a trap. When you let the way that you feel about who God is and, and, and all these different things, if you let the way that you feel dictate truth, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Because people let the way they feel dictate truth, they believe that Muslims are on their way to heaven. Because people let the way that they feel dictate truth, they believe that homosexuals are on their way to heaven. And they're listening to them preach the Word of God to them on a Sunday-to-Sunday -Sunday basis. Because of the way they feel, God could not condemn that man to hell. No way. He's so nice. He's so godly. I don't feel that God is that way. And I don't care what the Bible says. My God is not like that. Be careful. Because of the way people feel, they don't believe anymore that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Or that fornication is condemned by God. As long as we love each other. And on and on the list goes. If you allow the way that you feel to dictate truth in your life, don't do it. Allow truth to dictate the way you feel. And let God paradigm shift your mind because He's different than you and He's different than me. And I'm telling you right now that I still feel, it feels wrong to say that two people have to separate from one another that are in a second marriage. It feels not right. But... The Bible says, Jesus Christ says, that it's adultery. And I'm, allow, I'm, I'm learning to allow God to change the way that I think. Even if it's sad. Even if it's grieving to my heart. But we must not play games with the Son of God. And the words that He had to say about this matter, it's of utmost importance. Now I'm going to take a little bit of time here. I know... This might go a little bit longer than usual, but I think it's important to address some issues concerning this. You see, all these objections start coming up in our hearts and in our minds. We think of a, a, a grandpa and a grandma who've been married for 40 years who are on their second marriage and we think, there's no way. They're so godly. Or we think of a situation that we might be in or that a friend of ours in, is in. 
where a husband is beating a wife or where somebody committed adultery against their spouse or, and the list goes on and on. And so I want to bring up some common objections to this where the heart goes, wait a minute. Things that came up in my heart when I first heard about this. The first one that came up in my heart when somebody told me about this that said, they told me, I believe Jesus meant exactly what he said about this and we've got to take him seriously and literally. I just went, no way. The, the cataclysmic crashing down of the, the multiplied millions of divorced and remarried people in the world just crashed down upon me. I said, no, this cannot be the condition of the world. There can't be that many adulterers out there. It can't be that wicked and an adulteress of a generation. No way. I can't accept that truth. People in my own family came to mind. A, a person in my church, and here's the first objection I came up with was, but I know a godly couple. You don't know these people. His name is, is Jamie Gaino and, 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 and his wife, Terry. And I, I, I watched them get married, and they're such a powerful couple, and they're on their second marriage, and you can't tell me that they're living in adultery. This just can't be true. They're so godly. They're so good together. They have children together. He also had children. He had a few children with the other wife too, but I mean, he has little ones now. Like, this can't be true. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to think through all these things. And so let, let's just look at that. Some common objections, but I know such a godly family and couple that's divorced and remarried, Scott, or, or Jesus. What do you mean? It can't be adultery. Whoever, I know it says whoever marries a divorced woman, but I mean, it can't mean whoever. But did you know it's the same word that Jesus said when he said, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We love that whoever. We love it so much because it includes us. We say, yes, Lord. That's for me. I'm in there. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. Whosoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That's not me or my grandpa or my friend or really anybody that I, I, I can think of because I don't want to imagine that they're in there. But it's the same word, whosoever. Again, if we start to go by our feelings... We could start saying, I know many godly Buddhists who've got to be on their way to heaven. They've got to be on their way to heaven. I cannot believe that there's no other name under heaven given among men where we must be saved. I can't believe it in all cases because there's so many godly Hindus. There's so many godly Muslims. But in reality, we believe what the Word of God says, that without Christ, they're facing an eternity apart from God. They need Christ. But what about this? What about this situation over here? What about the excuse, I wasn't a Christian when I first got married? What about that idea that I know that, okay, I believe what Jesus had to say, but, but I wasn't a Christian in my first marriage? The implication here is that I'm not accountable to what I did before I came to Christ and that God doesn't recognize unbelieving marriages. Both of these statements are false. God does cause us to be accountable to things we've done before Christ. Zacchaeus is a great example. A man before he came to Christ who ripped people off and when he encountered the living Christ he started giving his money away and repaying people back and Jesus said, this day salvation has come to this home. Repentance was happening in reality in Zacchaeus's life. It's very clear that Jesus recognizes and joins together unbelieving marriages. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it says, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But adulterers and fornicators God will judge. Herod is a good example. His, it was a marriage. It was an unlawful one. You, you remember that here's an unbeliever that his brother had a wife and then that wife was taken somehow and, and here's John the Baptist. He lost his head over the issue of divorce and remarriage, you know. Condemning unbelievers. 
to say that I didn't, I didn't know Jesus in my first marriage and so therefore I'm not accountable to that. I'm just going to kind of pick up here now. I don't think that that holds much weight. Because what you're saying is that God didn't join me together with that person. And you're hoping that you're not committing adultery with the person you're with now. You're saying God didn't recognize that as a legitimate marriage. When all over the New Testament he does. What about this thought? My spouse cheated on me. The implication here is I can get remarried if my spouse commits adultery against me. If they go out and commit adultery, then, then I'm, I'm entitled. Jesus gives me the stamp of approval to go and get married again. And I would just say this, that I challenge you to find one place in the New Testament where it clearly states that you're free to get remarried if your spouse commits adultery on you. Maybe to some of you, Matthew chapter 19, verse 9 comes to mind where Jesus did talk about this. He talked about the exception clause of fornication, of sexual immorality. But I would challenge you and go to that scripture and look to see if that clearly gives license for a man to go and marry again if he finds himself in a situation where his spouse has cheated on him. Compare it to the scriptures that clearly say divorce and remarriage is adultery. That whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. I would challenge you to, to do that. To make absolute certain that, that your stance there is clear on, on what you're seeing. I want to read from a, an early Christian really quick. This was only 50 years after the death of the last apostle. A man named Hermes wrote an, an analogy called the shepherd. And, and in this, this, this was considered by many Christians, early Christians, in this time to be scripture. They found ma manuscripts of the Bible where this is not just attached to the end of it, but it's right in there with the New Testament, the shepherd. And, and, and in there, there's all kinds of interesting analogies and things and conversations between people. And in there, it says this. A question, what then, sir, is the husband to do if his wife continues in her vicious practice, speaking of adultery? And he said the husband should put her away and remain by himself. But if he puts his wife away and marries another, he also commits adultery. Again, this isn't recognized as scripture by us necessarily, but this is, these are testimonies of the early church, people who took these things very seriously, read them in the same language, and had access to the people that wrote about them. These things should carry a high weight. In fact, I would encourage you to study and examine the early church because here's another uh, excuse or, or a common objection that will come up in your heart. Who's teaching this today? Like, seriously, this is just, this has got to be wrong because nobody's teaching this. That's what I, I had to cross that bridge. I had to just go, wait a minute here. This is, you're trying to tell me that like 95% of the professing church today is totally off on this subject? That was a hard pill to swallow. But then I read the early church, and I would encourage you to do the same. Read the people who knew the apostles. Read the people that spoke the same language as the apostles. Read the people that were within 100 or 200 years from the birth of the church and see what they had to say about divorce and remarriage. You'll be shocked. They would be thrown out of churches today. They would be called heretics for their stance on divorce and remarriage. When it's the opposite today. You take a stance on this issue and you'll be labeled a heretic so quick. But I remember coming to this conclusion. One of two realities is true. Either the church within the first 200 years that spoke the same language and knew the apostles, either they got totally off on not only this issue, but a bunch of issues within the first 150, 200 years of the church. Either they totally missed it and the apostles failed to pass on the faith once delivered. And 1900 years later, we figured it out and came to true doctrine. Or, possibly, just maybe, 2,000 years of church history, translations, and culture, and liberalism setting in in this society has caused us to miss it. And the early church was a lot closer to the truth. 
And I took that premise and I took it to the Scriptures and I compared the early church's writings with the Scriptures and they're much more true and much more literal. And they give respect to the Word of God more than many commentators do today. I would challenge you to do that. Look into these things and see if what I'm saying is just heresy or if it genuinely is the testimony of the church from the beginning. What about this one? I've had children with my second spouse. This is, things get so hard. These things are not easy. It's a mess. There's, and I'm not saying the children from an adulterous relationship are a mess. They're beautiful lives that God did create. I believe that. And every man and woman will be responsible for their own sin. Children will not be held responsible for the sins of their fathers, the sins of their mothers. Each person will stand before God and give an account of their own life. Whether someone's born in fornication, they're born in adultery as we usually think of it, or they're born in an adulterous relationship, they're born from rape, the children will not have to answer for these things. But it doesn't change the fact that the parents, according to God's word, are still in adultery. The implication here is God wouldn't want me to abandon my children I would agree with you 100%. God would not want you to abandon your children. God would want you to care for your offspring. God would want you to rear them and raise them the best way that you could. God would want you to take the responsibility that is upon you for bringing life into this world. But it doesn't change the fact that divorce and remarriage is adultery according to Jesus. And adultery must be repented of. I don't know exactly what that looks like. No wonder, as the, the scripture was read today in Ezra, they said this isn't a matter of a day or two. These people took it seriously. They had children. They had to really figure out, what are we going to do here? How are we going to make this right? How are we going to get our life right with God? And how are we going to love our fellow man? The fruit. The fruit of, of the womb. How are we going to do that? Would we counsel a homosexual couple that adopted children to stay together because there's children? Would we say, because there's children, I think God's going to overlook, overlook the homosexuality. I think at this point, everyone in this tent could say, no, that would be absurd. They need to repent of the homosexuality and somehow care for those children they've adopted. And somehow we put this issue of adultery into a different class because it's not stigmatized in our culture like homosexuality is. It's got the stamp of approval on it. Remarriage is okay. Remarriage is fine. You just, if you go through a little process. Yeah, it gets kind of sticky. People kind of fight over stuff. But it'll be over soon. And you can go get yourself another one. That's what this culture's telling us. And it's not God's will. And we need to learn, we need to realize how our brain has been taught to think like this culture and we need to learn to think like God but my husband beat me how about this one oh it's so hard what about domestic violence the implication here is God wouldn't want me to live in a dangerous situation so I can marry another person but I think so quickly we, we, we don't look at what God's word has to say and we so quickly jump to these conclusions of God wouldn't want me to be in a, a dangerous situation I would agree with that potentially, in this, this situation. But we jump to the conclusion, so God wants me to marry someone else. But there's no, there's no license for that in the Scriptures. This does come into effect, though, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. To the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. It does seem that there's a provision here that's made for some kind of a situation where a woman needs to be at a distance from a man. If she departs from her husband, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Those two options. But not to be married again. There may be situations like that. Maybe even where the church has to step in and help. I don't even know. There's a lot of situations that, that take seeking great counsel from God. But what I'm trying to say here is that 
we, we got to not jump to these conclusions and, and permit remarriage just because situations seem hard. God makes provision for these things. Believe it or not, nowadays, and this is the last one that I'll bring up, there's, there's many different things we could talk about. But believe it or not, nowadays, this excuse is used, I would think, more often than any. People don't even realize they're using it. But it's this, is that Jesus wasn't talking to me when he said those things. Now, you, you might think, well, that sounds absurd. Of course Jesus was talking to us. We have to take these things personally. But this idea, this, this false doctrine and heresy, I'll call it, of dispensational thought that has permeated this country is this underlying cancer that is not recognized for what it really is. It's easy to see a Mormon or Jehovah's Witness walking down the road and identify them and, and say, okay, it's a Mormon. They teach heresy. The church is up in arms about what the Jehovah's Witnesses are preaching. And I, I think they ought to be about many of those things that are spoken. These things are easily recognized, but there's other teachings and doctrines that have affected more people than those that are right in our midst. And dispensational thought simply says this, is that Jesus was not talking to you, but he was talking to the Jew. He was talking to Jews. The things Jesus had to say in the Sermon on the Mount, or all of his commandments pretty much, everything that Jesus had to say in way of commandment, that was Jesus setting up his kingdom then. And now he's doing something different. Now he's giving a gospel of grace. And sure, he had to say these things, but we don't have to obey him. Because what you do or don't do has nothing to do with your salvation. This is where it all ends, and this is where it all comes to. This is the head that dispensationalism comes to. It says you don't have to obey Jesus. You don't have to do what he says. What he was saying was not for you. But I would question that so straightforwardly and say, put this foolishness away. If Jesus wasn't saying that to you, then what could you claim Jesus is saying to you? Anything? Where do you draw the line? You're forced to pick and choose. Of course, John 3.16 refers to you. Of course, Jesus being the resurrection and the life and he who dies shall live again. That refers to you. Of course, but he who marries a divorced woman, that's so easy to say, you know what, I don't, I don't think that refers to me. Jesus was talking to somebody else. No, Jesus was talking to us. This is his word for us to take today. Why is Jesus so serious about this? Why is his standard so high? Why does it seem that no matter where you turn, Jesus is saying, one marriage, one woman, one man, one flesh, don't separate. Anything outside of that is adultery. Why? First of all, like I said at the beginning, we don't need to answer the question why. A good answer is because Jesus Christ is the king and this is his kingdom. But something I think that can give us a vivid picture is how Jesus Christ and his relationship to his church is pictured. And he desires it to be pictured in the marriages of those within his kingdom. Paul says it's a great mystery that I'm talking about Christ and the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands, submit yourselves to your, or wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord, even as the church does to Christ. This kind of stuff, it's a great mystery and it's beautiful. And Jesus says that he wants a bride that's spotless and without blemish. Jesus is working overtime to present to himself a chaste virgin. He talks about virgins waiting for him. He uses this imagery all over the New Testament. The first thing we experience in heaven is a wedding feast between us and Christ. We're a spouse to him. And he wants this relationship to be displayed before the world within his church. He does not want the world to look in and see such a reproach that those who claim his name, their divorce rate is the same as the world. He wants to see people who are serious about marriage, serious about the stance that they take on it, 
serious about their commitments one to another, and that their lives vividly display the glory of heaven and the relationship he desires to have with us. In Revelation chapter 2, Jesus says, I have this against you. To his dearly beloved church, you've left your first love. Your first love. It's me. I'm your first love. Repent. Repent. Come back to me. Your first love. And this, I believe, is at the core of what God is doing. He does something beautiful when two, a man and a woman come together in their first love. He makes them one flesh. And it's a holy thing. It means so much to God. And within His kingdom, He's putting these parameters that He might vividly display His glory within the church and to the world. I know that some of you may be stirred up in your emotions because of what Jesus had to say about remarriage. I remember being confused, angry, and deeply troubled by the words that Jesus said on this issue for the first time. You may have already raised up a wall of defense against the words of Jesus. I know people's faces have come into your mind, people you love dearly and deeply. Maybe you are remarried and are hearing this teaching for the first time. Maybe you're divorced and you're contemplating getting married again. This teaching comes in and it touches us very deeply. I want to ask this question. Do you love wife or husband more than Christ? If Jesus said he, was, he was, loves his father and his mother and his wife and his children more than me, it's not worthy of me. If it doesn't refer to this issue, I don't know what it refers to. It hits home on this issue. If you don't believe you are supposed to repent, do you have a good biblical reason why? Can you honestly go to the scriptures and can you say, I believe with all my heart that I'm safe in the relationship that I'm in or I'm safe to get remarried because this is what the scriptures have to say. If you ever come to that position, find it right here. Find it in God's Word. Look here. Don't listen to what anybody has to say. But look in the Scriptures to see if that's true. Are you willing to stand before Christ one day having lived in a relationship that He's called adultery and hope it's not? These are sober questions. Many millions will reject the plain words of Jesus, not because they were too difficult to understand, but because they were too costly to obey. Will you? Father, I am sobered by what you have to say about this issue. God, I know there's so many things that I haven't covered. There's so many situations that happen in these relationships. Jesus, I want to thank you for being honest with us, Lord. I really do. I want to admit that I've been frustrated with you in, pa in past times, Lord, concerning this issue. Almost as if I wish you just didn't say that. But Lord, I just want to declare today that I'm glad you said that. Because I love you and I love your ways. And Lord, there's still things that I don't understand. And there's still things that we don't get. But Lord, I just pray and I ask that you would help us to understand your heart behind this. Lord, that you would help us follow after you no matter what the cost. That we would seek your face, Lord God, in these matters. Oh, I pray for everybody listening to this message right now, whether it's on the internet or it's right here in this tent, oh God, that you would just cause this message to fall upon our hearts, Lord. That if anything, it would just stir up us to seek your face, Lord, concerning the situations that each one of us are in. And Father, that you would bring light and bring truth and open eyes and open hearts, Lord God. We want to be a church, Lord God, that shines and glows with the radiance of your glory. We don't want to put aside, Lord, your hard teachings. So we ask that you would make these things a reality among us, Lord. And God, you would keep us from adultery in all of its ways, Lord, that it can come into our lives. That when you return, Lord, we might be able to, with unashamed face, Lord, and confidence, stand before you and hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. I know these things bring up all kinds of questions, concerns, thoughts. I want to avail myself to any conversation, any questions, any uh, corrections if you have, different scriptures that you want to bring up. I'm open and teachable. I want to, I want to know God's word and I want to know his will. And I hope you do too. And so I don't promise to have all the answers. We've been in some situations where it gets sometimes confusing. It gets hard to understand and difficult to face repentance and what it looks like. It becomes sobering to give advice on such eternal matters. But at the same time, as disciples of the Lord, we want to stand beside you and we want to help in these kind of situations. So we, we give our hearts to that. Thank you.